There are so many different types of sword designs, but which one is best for a fantasy medieval adventurer? Well, it is my opinion that the best tool in your toolbox is versatility. So allow me to propose this. Greetings adventurers, my name is Kramer, and today's video is brought to you by my patrons over on Patreon, who have given me the resources I needed to order this custom Kalamasil LARP weapon with which to test all of my theories. So thank you everybody so much. And if you would like to help support not just the channel and my content, but me as a person, then the link to my Patreon is down in the description. I'm not going to go through the pros and cons of every single sword design because there are just way too many. And I don't really need to because this sword combines the pros of arming swords and long swords. And you could put whatever blade you wanted on this. You could have it be a falchion. You could put whatever guard on this that you wanted. You could have it be a basket hilt potentially. It is the overall dimensions that are important. And even if you prefer some other weapon as your main weapon, it's still always a good idea to have some sort of sidearm. So don't think that this video doesn't apply to you because the proportions of this are actually ideal. And as with my cloak video, I do have a tacit endorsement from one of the world's most famous monster hunters, the Witcher Geralt of Rivia. So first I need to explain why witchers are the quintessential baseline fantasy adventurer and why we should all be learning from them and comparing uh, adventurers from other worlds to witchers. A witcher, for anyone who is unfamiliar, is a monster hunter, a bounty hunter of sorts, and they travel the continent using swords, magic, and potions, and various oils, which kind of act as poisons, in order to bring down their quarry in return for a little bit of coin before moving on to the next town. A witcher is a jack of all trades, and taken to any one of its extremes, it starts to look a lot more like one of the specialized classes that we're used to in a game like, say, Dungeons and Dragons. With a focus on heavier armor and more sword play, a witcher becomes a fighter. With a focus more on signs, which is magic in the Witcher universe, the Witcher becomes more like a spell sword or a mage, potentially. With a focus more on tracking and preparation, there is little that separates a Witcher from a Ranger. And with a focus on human targets, a Ranger is very little different than a Rogue. And all of these exist in a fantasy world with monsters, magic, in a different setting than our own. And I cannot stress that enough, that this is a world where creatures the size of elephants can move at the speed of a cheetah, breathe fire, and fly. According to what is apparently a direct translation from the Polish version of the Witcher books, Witcher swords, first sword, side right steel, or coming from meteorite, blacksmith in Mahakam, dwarvish strongholds, Inch length, 40.5 inches. Blade itself, 27.25 inches. Wonderful weighting. Weight of the handle is precisely the weight of the blade. Weight of entire weapon, under 40 ounces. Craftsmanship of handlebar and handle, simple but elegant. So the witchers in the books use approximately 40 inch swords with 27 inch blades, which means that they have a 13 inch handle. In The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, Ibir Hattori estimates that Geralt's sword is 38 inches long. And originally, I assumed, probably like many people, that he must have meant just the blade alone. But in this new light, it seems to me like Geralt's swords in the game might be intended to be 38 inches long in total. Geralt is supposed to be around 6 foot 2. Henry Cavill, who plays Geralt, is 6 foot 1. And this would mean that Geralt is using a sword that is very small compared to his overall height. And we will see that this is visually consistent with the way that the swords are portrayed in the Witcher Netflix show. So as many problems as I have with that show, the design of Geralt's swords actually isn't one of them. Taking the ratio of Geralt's height at 74 inches to his 40 inch sword with a 27 inch blade and a 13 inch handle, I, who am 67 inches, should be using a sword that is approximately 36 inches in length with a 12 inch handle and a 24 inch blade. This happens to be a good medium. It is 38 inches with a 13 inch handle. And you can go ahead and check out this video up here so that you can see how I did the math of that when I'm coming up with ratios for character weapons. And you'll also learn a little bit more about Kalamasil as a company and there will be a link to them in the description, not sponsored by them, sadly. So what on earth is this weapon? Its handle is a third of the length of its blade. It's not an arming sword. It's not a long sword. It's not even what we would technically consider a bastard sword or a hand in a half sword. This is a war sword handle 
on an arming sword length blade. It is weighted almost precisely at the hilt, which in theory would diminish its cutting capacity. And compared to other historical two-handed weapons, its reach is terrible. And this might be chalked up to the idea that Andrew Sapkowski knows nothing about swords and that when he designed this, he wasn't taking history into account and they would have to be redesigned in order to be more historical. But historical accuracy is not the same thing as believability. Something being a fantasy is never an excuse for a poor design. I think it is completely possible and necessary that there is a certain level of realism when we are designing things for medieval fantasy. So I'm not saying that it's just fantasy, therefore it works. But nothing would stop this sword in its dimensions from existing. It's just that it didn't in our world. Probably. In order to accurately represent a fantasy world, we cannot do it by solely comparing the elements of that world to our own and then simply dismissing everything that isn't historically accurate by our standards. Our first step must be to solidly place ourselves into this new world and get that context. So then we can see what works and does not there. Immediately, the shorter blade length explains how the witchers are able to wear their swords on their backs. The shorter blade means that you don't need a special scabbard in order to draw them because they're not long enough to be an issue. And it would explain the speed of their draw and of their fighting style as the shorter, perfectly balanced blade has a longer fulcrum and is easier to maneuver. They aren't wearing these swords on their backs because they're too long to be worn on their hips. They're wearing them on their backs because they're short enough that it doesn't matter and in an adventuring context, there are a lot of reasons why you would want to wear a sword on your back. Some might buy this explanation, but still say that it's not enough to justify the blatant reach disadvantage that a sword like this would have. But remember, it's not that the sword itself is abnormally short. It's that the handle is abnormally long. Plenty of swords historically had blades that were this short or shorter. And many members of the Lord of the Rings reenactment community choose to use arming swords instead of long swords because they're simply easier to wear in the woods. If witches valued reach, then they would be using ranged weapons or pole arms, but they're not. From this, we can infer that reach is not the most important element in a witcher's fighting style. Witchers also use signs and drink potions during combat, which indicates that they need to be able to wield their sword with only one hand. Based on the fighting style of witchers, which includes dodges and feints, pirouettes and flourishes in order to confuse a monster, I believe that the most valued element of a witcher's fighting style is speed. And this design already makes this weapon an incredibly fast and maneuverable one. In the hands of a witcher, it would be absolutely devastating. And the addition of eight inches of steel would not only be useless, but potentially detrimental. For a normal human being without enhanced speed, it's a lot easier to increase your reach artificially with the length of your weapon, whether that's a spear or a bow, and both of those would still be a better choice than a longsword if reach was like the top consideration for you. But how does that change if you're fighting a creature that will always outreach you even if you're using a spear? It's not directly the same thing as hunting a boar or a rhinoceros, because both those creatures still need to be able to touch you in order to hurt you, so keeping distance is important. But if you're fighting a griffin or a basilisk, they have attacks that will reach you without you being able to touch them no matter what you're using. So at what point do you experience diminishing returns with the length of your weapon in a scenario with a creature that can both brawl with you and also fly? If you were my size, fighting someone the size of the mountain, Sir Gregor Clegane, there is literally no weapon that would give me a reach advantage other than a bow, and no weapon could give me a strength advantage over him. So against a creature of that size, even if I block or parry or wear super heavy armor, if I get hit, I am going to die. The only way to win, aside from not fighting at all, um, which is not an option if it's my job to fight these creatures, the only way to win is to not get hit and deal as much incapacitating damage as possible within as short a time span as possible. Now, I don't have superhuman speed or strength, so instead of scaling me, we can scale the weapons. This is a real steel sword. Compare the speed I can maneuver this to the speed I can wield this much shorter, much lighter LARP sword. Now, if this LARP sword had the ability to kill, take both versions of me. Which one would you bet on to win? Even if the enhanced speed and strength allowed you to wield the real steel longsword with the same speed that I can wield this shorter LARP one, you would still be able to wield the shorter weapon even faster than that. 
When you're traveling on the open road in a fantasy scenario with monsters and such, you rarely know who it is that you're going to be fighting or where you're going to be fighting. So it makes sense to have a weapon that can do everything and then have another weapon that will pick up the slack. So have a spear or a bow in order to create distance and range and just have your sword as your backup weapon. And in the case of an adventuring sword, don't worry about reach, worry about versatility, which is where this weapon shines. The longer handle makes it easier for weaker people to wield. The shorter blade means it's lighter to transport. The shorter blade makes traveling through dense forest and underbrush and sneaking easier either on your back or your hip or carried. The shorter blade makes fighting in confined spaces less cumbersome. You can use it with a shield. You can dual wield it. You can use it as a sidearm. You can drink a potion without losing the effective use of your weapon. You can spell cast with it. You can still two hand it and use longsword techniques. I am struggling to think of a downside to this weapon design. And if this weapon were more popular in an adventuring society, then you wouldn't even need to worry about fighting opponents with longer swords because they likely wouldn't have them. They just have these if they were smart. And and as I just recently found out sparring, if you're facing an opponent with much greater reach or with a pole weapon or both, the difference between this blade and this blade is non-existent because you still have to close that distance anyway, and that requires speed. So this sword design is faster than an arming sword because the longer handle gives you more control. And it's also faster than a long sword because the shorter blade gives you more control. And if all of that still doesn't have you convinced, Kramer, it's just a LARP sword. How could you possibly know whether or not that was going to work? This is my real sword. It is almost a one for one in its dimensions. The blade is just ever so slightly longer, like maybe an inch and a half. And the handle is still longer than I've seen on historically accurate bastard swords and hand and a half swords. This is easily a three or four handed handle. If it's good enough for Geralt of Rivia, it's good enough for me. And if you still aren't sold on the idea that the dimensions of this sword design make it the perfect versatile adventuring tool, then let me know in the comments below. Thank you once again to my very generous patrons on Patreon for giving me the resources I needed to finally make this video. I've been sitting on it for a while and we will definitely be seeing this sword a lot in the future. Hopefully I'm not stirring the pot too much by breaking with historical accuracy, but if you'd like to see some more of my thoughts on how weapons could have been used, you can watch this video here. And if you'd like to see my thoughts on the Netflix Witcher TV show, then you can start down here. And in the meantime, I'd like to wish you good luck on your adventures.